Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Deen and Chai, casual space to talk about Deen over a cup of chai or coffee or any beverage you'd like. Today we're going to be talking about Surah Al Alaq, inshallah. And the main source we're looking at is Tafsir ibn Kathir. And so let's jump right into it basically with a background of Surah Al Alaq and when it was revealed. Okay, so the first few verses of Surah Al Alaq are considered to be the first revelation that ever came down to the Prophet. So let's talk about what was happening at that point in time. So we know from narrations that the first thing that started happening with the Prophet is that he started having dreams and then those dreams would come true. He would not see any dream except that it would come true just like the clearness of the daybreak in the morning. So very clear dreams that were coming true and that was what was happening to him at the beginning before he got the first verses. And then he started to really like seclusion. He really liked to have to be isolated, have his own space and time. So he would go to this cave called Ghar Hira, the cave of Hira, and he would stay there in seclusion, just contemplating, thinking about life, reflecting in silence and peace. So he would go to the cave and devote himself to worship. And sometimes he would even spend a few nights in the cave. So he would take enough food for a few nights, enough food and, and necessities for a few nights, and then would stay there and then come back to his wife Khadija anha, after a few nights. And then sometimes just replenish what he had and then go back again and so on. So he started to really like seclusion. And this was happening until finally in one of these moments of seclusion, revelation came down to him. So he was in this cave, the cave of Hira, and the angel Jibreel appeared and said to him, read, iqra. Now the Prophet وسلم, was illiterate. He couldn't read or write. So he said, Ma ana I cannot read. I am not one who reads. And then the Prophet said that this angel seized him so tight until he could no longer bear it and then it released him. And again said, read. And again he said, Ma ana I am not one who reads. And then again this angel pressed him so tight until he could no longer bear it and then released him and said, read. And again, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Ma ana biqarat." And then he was pressed a third time, so tight until he could no longer bear it. And then Jibril released him and said, "Iqra bismi Rabbi al ladhi khalaq khalaq al insan min alaq. Iqra wa Rabbi al akram al ladhi alam bil qalam alam al insan ma lam yalam." And these are the first five verses that were revealed to the Prophet. And so he returned now, he left the cave having learned these five verses and he was terrified. He didn't know what was going on or what had just happened. He was so terrified and frightened. So he went rushing home, frightened. And once he got home, he said, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, wrap me up, wrap me up. So he was wrapped up until he calmed down and his fear subsided. And then he explained to his wife Khadija anha what had just happened to him. And he said, Qad ala nafsi. I fear that something may happen to me. He was terrified of what had just happened. And Khadija replied, comforting him and calming him down, telling him, never, by Allah, Allah will never disgrace you. You keep good relations with your relatives. You speak the truth. You help the poor. You serve your guests generously. And you help the deserving calamity afflicted people. So she reminded him that you are a good person. You are a good person and you have all these good qualities and all these good things that you do. So God is not going to disgrace you. And then she suggested that they go visit her cousin, Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Waraqa ibn Nawfal was a Christian and he used to write scriptures. He was a very wise, devout, religious person. And so Khadija suggested that they go and visit this cousin of hers. So they went and they explained to Khadija his cousin what had happened. Waraqa responded saying, this is an namus meaning this is Jibreel that came to you. This is an namus whom Allah had sent to Musa. So he explained to him that this is Jibreel who had come to Musa before you. And he continued and said, I wish I was young and could live until the time when your people would drive you out. Now the Prophet ﷺ was surprised to hear this. So he said, Will they drive me out? And Waraqa replied that, yes, anyone who came with something similar to what you have brought 
was treated with hostility and if I should remain alive till that day, then I would firmly support you. So he told the Prophet ﷺ, yes, that anyone before you that came with a similar message was driven out by their people, re received a lot of hostility from their people. It was a difficult journey uh, for them. Now, Waraqa, because of his old age, he did not remain for much longer, so he passed away well before he saw the Prophet's people drive him out. So that is a little bit of background of what happened with these first few verses that were revealed and what happened after they were revealed and the emotions that he was going through. And let's dive into now the, those first five verses and let's talk about them in a little bit more detail. Okay, so we have the first ayah, اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق read in the name of your Lord who has created. So there's several benefits that are taken from this verse. The first one is that meaning read with the support of your Lord. So read with the support of your Lord. Yes, you are illiterate, but read with the support of your Lord. Your Lord will support you. So keep reading with his support. The second benefit is that it is instructing the Prophet ﷺ to read in the name of his Lord, which is why when we recite or when the Prophet ﷺ would recite, he would start off saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. So that it would be clear that when he starts to recite the words of the Quran, that he is reciting the Quran and not just saying something from his own words. So he would start off saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and then say the verses so that it's clear that it's not his own words, this is coming from Allah. So he starts off with in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, and then recites those verses to distinguish between our human speech and words that are coming from Allah. And then we go to the next verse. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ He has created man from a clot. Now in the first verse, it is said, read in the name of your Lord who created. It was general. He created. He created everything. At the end of the day, Allah has created everything. But then in the next verse, he goes to talk about one specific thing that he has created. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ he created man from a clot. So now he talks specifically about man. In our creation itself is a big lesson and reminder for us. The intricacy in our creation should be a sign to us of Allah and the incredible power and precision and details in everything. SubhanAllah, that alone to us is a big sign, is a big miracle in all of these little details that make us work. And the interesting thing is that the word alaq, it is includes the meaning that something is clinging or something is hanging and subhanallah this is only something that we have learned in now modern science that it is actually clinging on so this verse is telling us from over 1400 years ago that it's as something is clinging there min alaq the word that is used captures the meaning of something that is clinging or hanging on subhanallah so even the choice of words is so precise and then we continue iqra wa rabbukal akram read and your lord is the most generous so allah reminds us in the previous verse that we are created from a clot we are created from the smallest most insignificant thing and this is something that should humble us at the end of the day we are all created from this tiniest substance and that should bring humility to us that we are all equal we come from the same substance we shouldn't look down on each other this should humble us that we are really coming from the most insignificant thing and then in this verse he tells us that he is the most generous or the most noble so he reminds us to be humble and have humility and then he reminds us who is the most noble of all so read and your lord is the most generous or the most noble he is also reminding the prophet ﷺ through this that he is the most generous he is not trying to burden the prophet ﷺ or make his life difficult so he's reminding the prophet ﷺ of his quality of generosity, that he's coming from a generous place. He's been generous in how he created man and, and what he gives, and he is generous now with the Prophet ﷺ. Who has taught by the pen. One of the things that makes us humans unique is 
the ability to learn or the intellect that we have and the ability to preserve that knowledge that we learn. So not only can we comprehend knowledge and also speak that knowledge, but we can also preserve it by writing it down. That is another sign and another blessing for us to really recognize how generous Allah has been with us in the way that he has created us. He has created us in the most intricate ways, with the most detail, but also with intellect, us having intellect, us being able to think and reflect, us being able to speak and communicate that intellect, as well as being able to preserve and write things down. Because of the pen and the ability to write and preserve, that is also how the Qur'an is preserved for us today. Alhamdulillah. And then we have عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ he has taught man that which he knew not. Again, a reminder to us of our intellect and that it is because of Allah that he has allowed us to learn that which we do not know. He has given us this, this knowledge and this ability to learn and he has taught us that which we wouldn't have known if he didn't give us these abilities or this knowledge. And again, it is out of Allah's generosity that he taught man that which he did not know. So those were the first five verses that were revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. Allah chose to highlight that he has created everything and specifically to highlight us as creation, to reflect on ourselves and look at how generous he has been with us in our form of creation, in the intricacy of the details of our creation, in our knowledge and our intellect, the ability to learn, the ability to record and so on, and a reminder that Allah is the most generous. Those are the first few verses that he chose to reveal to the Prophet ﷺ. And then the rest of the verses came down at a later point in time. And so let's look at these next verses now. Nay, verily man does transgress. So kalla nay this format brings attention and exclamation emphasizes something highlights something brings our attention to the language that is coming right after it so it says kalla inna al insana la yatqa verily man does transgress so with certainty man does transgress man rebels thinks that they are free of need and therefore exceeds the boundaries that allah has set for man or for human. And he tells us in the next verse, Amra'ahu stagna, because he considers himself self sufficient. So Allah is telling us that man does transgress, and the reason is that man thinks he or she, the human thinks he or she is self sufficient. And that is when the human exceeds the bounds that Allah has set for them. Because that is when a human thinks that they can be independent and they don't need Allah, they are free of need. And therefore, they decide to exceed the bounds that Allah has set forth for them. Allah has set these bounds not to make things difficult, but actually to make our lives easier. Because if we live our lives within these bounds, then we are protected from certain things and we find comfort and peace in living our life with certain guidelines, inshallah. Inna ila rabbika ruj'a. Surely unto your Lord is the return. Now, this is another reminder for us. When we remind ourselves that we are going to be returning to Allah, it's a reminder to us that we are going to be held accountable for what we do. We are not going to get away with everything that we are doing. So we can't just trample on other people's rights and go about life however we want and treat others however we want or, or steal or cheat or live our lives in certain ways without being held accountable. So it's a reminder to us that indeed to Allah is the return, to our Lord is the return, and we will be held accountable at some point for our actions, for what we had, what we were given, how we used it, how we treated others, how we lived our day-to-day -day lives, and so on. And then we continue, أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يَنْهَى Have you seen him who prevents? And the next verse, أَعَبَدًا إِذَا صَلَّى A servant when he prays. Now, this is considered to be revealed about Abu Jahl because Abu Jahl would try to prevent the Prophet ﷺ from praying, whether by threatening him, making fun of him, cursing him, trying to make it difficult for him to pray at the Kaaba. So this verse is considered by scholars to be revealed about Abu Jahl, who used to continuously try to prevent the Prophet ﷺ from praying at the Kaaba. There's one hadith that is reported in Bukhari where Abu Jahl said, if I see Muhammad praying at the Kaaba, I will stomp on his neck. The next verse tells us, أَرَأَيْتَ إِنْ كَانَ عَلَى الْهُدَى 
Have you seen if he is on the guidance? Oh, amara bit taqwa or enjoins taqwa. So meaning that, do you think that this man who you are preventing from praying is upon the straight path in his action or is guided? Do you think that this man is guided or enjoins taqwa? So do you think that of this man, yet you are criticizing him and trying to prevent him from prayer? Ara'ayta in kathaba wa tawalla. Have you seen whether he denies the truth and turns away from it? So this man chose to deny the truth and turn away from it. And it's something that we should be reflecting on as well is the actions that we are putting forth and the consequences that those actions have. Are we through our actions turning away from Allah or are we getting closer to him? So it's something that we should reflect on what we are doing in our daily lives and the actions and things that we are committing in our day-to-day -day life inshallah. So to make sure that we are not turning away from Allah or denying what Allah has sent or the guidelines that he has put for us, but trying our best to work harder to to live our lives in those guidelines, inshallah. May Allah make it easy for us to live our lives within the bounds that Allah has created for us. And then he reminds us, Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Does he not realize that Allah sees all? So Abu Jahl and anybody else that was against the Prophet وسلم, do they not realize that Allah is seeing everything that they are doing? Do, do they not recognize this? Do they not remember it? And again, it's a reminder to us to remind ourselves that Allah is seeing, Allah is knowing. So to try to think twice before we do something, to remember that Allah is seeing, and also it should comfort us, inshallah, because sometimes we maybe are trying to do good and maybe nobody is recognizing it or our intention doesn't turn out as, as planned. We have a good intention and something works doesn't work out or whatever it is. We should find comfort that Allah knows and Allah sees, doesn't just see our in intentions, but he also sees what's in our heart. So he knows exactly what we are doing, the intentions behind it, and he will reward us accordingly. So that should be twofold for us. It should be a reminder to us that Allah is always watching, so not to cross certain bounds, but also as a comfort to us that when we are doing good, just to remember that Allah sees every good that we are doing and Allah knows all our intentions. And he knows the intentions that we make that we maybe don't follow through with, but he still rewards us for those intentions that we have. So he sees everything, everything we do and everything that is within us as well. Alhamdulillah. Kalla la illam yantahi. Nay, if he ceases not, la nasfa'am bin nasiya. We shall drag him by his forehead so that is what is going to happen to him if he doesn't stop so he is being told in this surah that if he doesn't stop he will have his forehead scorched or he will be dragged by his forehead <laughs> a lying sinful forehead so this is very strong wording against abu jahl saying that he will be dragged by his forehead or scorched on his forehead, a lying, sinful forehead. And it was said that Abu Jahl actually heard the Qur'an and believed that it was true, but still chose to reject it and deny it. And so Allah is calling him a liar in this surah, a lying, sinful forehead. So he's lying in his statements and he's sinful in his actions that he is doing. فَالْيَدْرُ نَادِيَةً then let him call upon his council. So let him call his people and his tribe to come help him now. Abu Jahl used to feel empowered because he had a big group of people also following him and listening to him. He had a certain level of power and, and status. So now Allah is saying that on this day, let him, let him call upon his council. Let him try to get help from them. We will call out the guards of hell. So again, strong wording and strong imagery. So Allah is telling him, you call upon your counsel and we will call upon ours. And then the last verse, Nay, do not obey him, prostrate in worship and draw near to Allah. So Allah is telling his Prophet وسلم, do not obey him. So don't worry about what he's doing. He's trying to prevent you from praying, trying to stop you from what you're doing. Do not give in to that. Do not let him stop you. Don't worry about it and you keep doing what you're doing. You keep praying where you want. You keep spreading the message. Keep doing what you want. Don't worry about it. Because Allah is the best of protectors. So he says, وَسْجُدْ وَقْتَرَبْ So fall in prostration, prostrate, 
and draw near. We have a hadith in Sahih Muslim um, that says, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدٌ فَأَكْثِرُ الدُّعَاءِ The closest that a servant can be to his Lord is when he is in prostration. Therefore, make abundant supplications. So you want to get close to Allah? اسجد واقترب Make sujood and draw near to Allah. That is the closest that you can be to Allah. So prolong your prostrations to Allah. Spend time in worship with Him. Make lots of dua and draw near to Him through those prostrations. So listen to us um, as well from this verse and from this hadith as well. That's pretty much it for Surah Al-Alaq. That brings us to the end of the surah. I hope you found benefit in this short reflection of the verses and a little bit of background of when these verses came down and the context um, of these verses. So I hope that was beneficial, inshallah. And until next time, assalamu alaikum.